it's there on the desktop somewhere. <laughs> Like that? Mm -hmm. Or like that or like that? That is. Okay. And then how does it come up there? Okay. Good morning. So throughout the year, um, some of the residents and fellows have kind of asked me about some of the different ways of suture lenses, and I think most of them will agree that I'm a pretty bad drawer. <laughs> so hopefully this will explain, you know, clarify some of the things I tried to explain to them during the year. Um, so there are uh, several different ways to manage um, dislocated lenses. <clears throat> you know, certainly, you can put in an ACIOL, you can suture a lens to the iris or sclera, um, you can suture the same lens to the iris or sclera, kind of depending on what's already in the eye. Uh, so ACIOLs aren't a bad option. I think everyone knows how to put them in. Um, they're fairly quick. Um, they do have several disadvantages, of course. Uh, glaucoma, uh, CME, corneal decompensation. The sizing of the uh, eye wall is important to prevent eye wall rotation, which um, can lead to uh, chronic inflammation um, and iris entrapment. So iris sutured lenses have advantages. They are pretty easy to do um, once you know how to do them um, and avoid potential angle complications seen with AC eye wells. And there's the absence of suture exposure risk seen with the scleral sutured lenses. Um, they also have disadvantages. Uh, pigment dispersion, inflammation, hyphema, CME. So, <clears throat> so this, I do have a video, but I wanted to kind of point out a few things. So this is a, obviously a dislocated lens. Um, they have captured it, um, brought it up and captured it in the pupil. Um, this is a modified mechanical iris suture who's using a tunnel proline to go through uh, paracentesis through the iris behind the haptic through the uh, iris again, and then he'll come out um, here. Um, the way uh, Chang described it in his paper, he had actually put a visco, uh, viscoelastic cannula through a different paracentesis site and caught um, this suture and pulled it out. Um, you can actually just pass it right through the peripheral cornea as well. And then uh, tie a seepster knot, which I will show you. Um, this was a paper written by Gary Condon, and he was just showing if you actually have to put the lens in the eye, you would fold it, um, uh, orient the haptics vertically, um, and so that they would go under the iris, and you would also capture the um, optic in the pupil. You can create a paracentesis at 180 degrees away and put in a cyclodialysis spatula to stabilize the lens so that it doesn't fall back. Um, um, <coughs> Dr. Crandall actually wrote a paper um, in which he described uh, placing the sutures in the iris before the lens is actually placed in the eye. Um, I have a, a picture of this, so it'll kind of make more sense when you see the picture, but he just basically passes the suture through the uh, cornea, through the iris, back out through the iris, and then back out through the cornea, and then he uses a Sinsky hook um, coming from across the eye, grabs the suture and pulls it out of the eye, and then ties a knot around the leading haptic, which is outside the eye. Um, so this is just a picture of that. <coughs> Those are the sutures, and then he's pulling the suture out of the eye, tying that knot, and then he's going to put the, the lens into the eye, and this is this knot, which I don't know if I would really know how to tie, but. <laughs> yeah, I've never actually seen him do it. Yeah, I've never actually seen you do that, but. Um, So um, some advantages, the sutures are placed in the iris in a closed setting. Um, that knot can slip on the haptic, so it adapts to the other suture when you're tightening it, and so that will um, potentially help center the eye well and keeps the pupil regular, and you avoid optic capture and blind attempts to engage the iris and the haptic with the suture, so reduce surgical trauma and minimizes iris manipulation. So when uh, doing an iris sutured lens, there are certain considerations. You want to make sure you're placing the suture uh, more peripheral to avoid the central iris. Um, which is more mobile, so it can lead to more inflammation than the regular pupil. Uh, you don't want the uh, bite length through the iris to be too large, so that can lead to pupil peaking. If it's too small, it can cheese wire through the iris and lead to less secure fixation around the haptic. 
Uh, if you tie the sutures too tight, that will also lead to pupil peaking, and um, there are different techniques of tying the sutures to the iris using either a seeps or knot, or micro tying forceps, or tying them outside of the eye. <coughs> this is just a UVM showing a, the acute alteration in iris profile at the point of uh, fixation. And of course, adequate pupillary dilation afterwards. And this was supposed to be my video. Yeah, but the yeah. how do I minimize the escape? Yeah. It's on here actually. Um, how do I go back to the desktop? Because it's in that file. So this, oh, it's playing. Yeah, it's still there. So this is just showing uh, folded IOL, directing it, uh, the haptics posterior, uh, vertically opening it so that it's captured in the pupil. The penopoene suture going through a corneal wound, through the iris, under the haptic, out through the iris, and then out through the peripheral cornea. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then uh, you use a Kublin hook to grab the peripheral suture and bring it towards your wound. so you have a loop and then your suture and you just need to identify sort of pulling on the suture to identify which part of that loop is attached to the needle because you want to use the other one um, to tie your knot and so it's just a three one one and then you pull both both ends uh, to tie the knot down um, how do I go back to the PowerPoint So indications for primary transcleral um, fixation, zonular dialysis, PXF, rent, a naturally uh, dislocated lens. Uh, secondary uh, would be contact lens intolerance and aphex CME associated with iris fixated and anterior chamber lenses, uh, corneal decompensation, and the IOL dislocation. Uh, there are certain advantages. You avoid contact with the corneal endothelium or the trochlear meshwork, minimizes contact with the iris, and it's more applicable for patients with distorted pupils, uh, iridectomies, and disrupted anterior chambers, patients with megalocornea. Uh, disadvantages, technically more difficult, longer surgical time. Um, potential for endophthalmitis if the suture erodes through the conjunctiva or sclera. Uh, potential for IOL tilt, vitreous concretization, and intraocular hemorrhages as you're passing the needles. Uh, so this is the lens um, that they use, a CZ lens. It has these eyelets, so you can pass your sutures through there to secure it. Uh, these are the needles, the CTC needle, that Snow mentioned. You should use either a Ninopoline or Niogortex. Uh, Dr. Crandall seems to use the Niogortex in children. Um, so there are a couple of different ways to suture. Um, you know, you can either, uh, you know, you, you, you have a double arm suture, pass it through the eyelet. You can either blindly pass it from inside to outside the eye. 
um, you can either go, you can go this way or you can go the other way. And this seems a little bit more dangerous than the other direction. Um, and this is just showing, this is basically showing the same thing. This is kind of going under the pupil and out of the eye. Um, and then once you pass the other one the same way, um, that would be secure. And that's kind of what you end up with. Um, so uh, Hoffman pockets, you know, pretty interesting. Basically, you'd create a conjunctival pertomy, uh, two of them 180 degrees apart, uh, two scleral tunnels. Um, and then you would use a 26 gauge needle, which is bent. So this can be, this pocket can be about three millimeters, but you should be entering about two millimeters close to your columbus uh, with a bent 26 gauge needle. And um, you take your 90 proline suture, enter through a corneal wound, and you catch it with this, um, with this needle and pull this needle out of the eye. Um, so that seems a little bit safe, more uh, safer than uh, blindly throwing needles from inside to out because at least you are measuring this distance so you can approximate um, the sulcus a little bit better. Um, so after you've done that twice, you have the two sutures coming out of the roof of the uh, scleral pocket, and this is just showing how to retrieve the suture end from underneath there, um, and then uh, you would tie them down. And so you'd end up with four-point scleral fixation, two over here and then two over there, so it's pretty secure. Um, this is a similar um, way of doing it, but starting from the corneal side, uh, you need to make a corneal incision between three and 400 microns and then dissect back so um, the advantage is that you wouldn't need to open the conjunctiva. Um, and then you would do the same thing, docking the suture in the same way. And then pulling the sutures out in the same way as you did with the Hoffman pockets, and then just tying them from the corneal side. Um, Dr. The way I've seen Dr. Crandall do it more recently um, is that he's actually been using a 23 gauge MVR to, um, he, he hasn't been making these pockets, he's just been using a 23 gauge MVR going two millimeters close to your columbus um, to make that uh, scleral incision. And then, um, uh, so there's an incision here and then using an ILM forceps to come in this way and then taking this loop and putting it into the, uh, into the eye with a Kublin hook and then just grabbing this loop with the ILM forceps and pulling it out so that there are no needles in the eye. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen you. I've seen him do it with the cortex. So with the scleral flap technique, you know, there are obvious, obviously risks of the thinning of the scleral flap. The knot can erode, it can bleed when you're making the flap. You can buttonhole the flap, and it takes a little bit more time to do that. Um, however, if you just put the, the knot under the conjunctiva, there's a risk of endophthalmitis um, if the knot erodes. Um, this is just uh, showing, uh, you know, if you have a, th you know, a three-piece lens there and you don't want to take the lens out of the eye, you can just loop you know, you can basically use the same principles and just loop, um, you know, 26 gauge needle, uh, put in a proline from the other side and grab it and pull it out. And so one uh, will go under the haptic, the other one will go over. Um, and so you're basically looping um, the haptic on either side. So there are obviously advantages to loop fixation. You don't need to take out the, the lens. It's a larger incision. Uh, if you were to take out a lens, uh, if you, you know, there's increased risk of vitreous loss, risk of iris trauma, um, postoperative astigmatism, and uh, if you would do it this way, there's uh, potentially less inflammation um, than iris fixation um, for in the bag dislocations. Uh, uh, and this is just showing kind of what you end up with with a loop there, and then you could put one on the other side too. Mm -hmm. It's just one is going under, one's going over, and then you would tie the knot out here. <coughs> so. Well, what you're showing there is, is not easy to do. Today, it's just in a capsular bag. Yeah. And it's in the capsular bag, you get a capsule off here. Usually, it doesn't do so well with the other. And so, uh, I don't know, Alan, is, would you have these ones that are starting to fall apart? You have one side that's off. Is, is this what you're doing in larger now? These are loop of an evidence now that you know. 
So, you know, you have a bunch of different choices, you know, the method of introducing the needle from external to internal, internal to external. Um, I like the way Dr. Crandall's been doing it uh, recently, um, uh, suturing the haptic, using the lasso or the eyelet, uh, the number of points of scleral fixation, and, and the method of avoiding suture erosion. So, uh, you know, if you, you can apply those same principles to uh, suture in a Sioni ring, um, this is basically the same thing, um, as well as an Ahmed segment. Those are the two features around the neural pathway. Thank you very much.
picture yourself in the center of Maryland or somewhere near Nikon. But the two guys that did all that spent a lot of math there. Mm -hmm. And each of these plates that are coming off are about one and a half microns. And uh, you'll see, and you'll see some places where one is flaking off and it's starting to go down lower. This is over a period of time. Mm -hmm. So if it's if you knock off off the circumference of two levels of plates and that's three microns or as far as a six, I mean you, you now have got His results on it are looking pretty good. I mean, I, I think if you got a good enough friction fit, but I wouldn't want to depend upon a friction fit for an average person to do it inside a watch. That would be my guess about that. But the thought that the two guys could do it is there. So it sounds good. It sounds like it's good. Like it's really good in IRL. Thank you. Thank you.